One of the most important factors in determining uh, the efficacy of a quantum mechanical calculation on a polyatomic molecule is one's choice of basis. And there are two primary considerations when you choose a basis. The first of these, naturally, is accuracy. Uh, you want to get results that are going to reflect what the real molecule, uh, the state of the real molecule. But the other is efficiency. Okay, if you cannot have an efficient calculation, chances are you may not even be able to finish it on a computer, even though computers are very fast and very big these days. So you're looking for some sort of balance between accuracy and efficiency in, uh, when undertaking these kinds of polyatomic systems. Now, there are two challenges that we uh, typically encounter uh, with basis sets um, when dealing with polyatomic molecules. One is the fact that because these uh, molecules have different atoms, they are inherently multi-center. So you have multi-center basis functions, which means that uh, one has to uh, have functions that are easy to deal with when, uh, when they exist on different atoms, and we need to calculate different kinds of expectation values. All right, so this is because we have atomic orbitals on each atom that are included in our molecular orbitals uh, that we have a multi-center basis function. The other thing is that polyatomic molecules are much larger. All right, the systems that we've been talking about, uh, you know, starting with a hydrogen atom, which is the smallest possible, but going even up into multi-electron atoms and diatomic molecules, they're limited in size. They have a limited number of electrons, a limited number of nuclei, um, so they're uh, somewhat easier to approach. But when we include uh, core electrons and everything else, these much larger polyatomics uh, become uh, significantly more challenging to, to deal with. So what we want to do is we want to come up with a way that we can uh, represent these basis functions for these much larger systems so that they both provide the accuracy that the Slater orbitals apparently provide, but also can uh, uh, overcome some of these challenges and become more efficient, if, we, if you will, uh, in how we do our calculations. So I'll remind you that the radial part, so this is just the radial parts of these equations. The radial part of the Slater orbitals looks something like this. It's got, uh, it's got a term that's r to the n minus 1 and an e to the minus uh, zeta r. And the angular part is the spherical harmonics. All right, what if we were to take this function and rewrite it uh, as something else that would be easier to deal with? Well, that's in essence what we're doing when we, um, you know, when we rewrite this, I'm going to say NLM as a Gaussian function. And again, I'm only talking about the radial part, so I probably shouldn't put all of these uh, labels on here, but we're going to keep the r to the n minus 1 part, but instead of this exponential, which is where a lot of the difficulty comes in, we're going to write this as e to the minus alpha r squared. Now this will probably actually be not r, but r minus r uh, 0, you know, for some location that's rel relative to another atom. Okay, but uh, the point is that it has this basic functional form. Now, this may not seem like a big change, um, but there are some things that we need to be aware of that uh, affect this change. So let's, let's graph this out. So if I were to graph, for example, the normal Slater orbital, um, you know, for some atomic, you know, for some atomic orbital, it would be an exponential decay that would come down something like this. At the fairly, uh, fairly steep, but uh, asymptotic decay to zero as r goes to infinity. All right, now if I want to uh, use a Gaussian, it turns out that uh, if I care about fitting the Gaussian here at the upper end, I'm going to end up with a function that looks something like this. All right, this is the basic profile of a Gaussian function. And uh, you'll see that for most of this, so all of this part, even going to infinity, this is a good fit. All right, so you say, well, okay, this function probably going to work pretty well. The only place where it does not fit very well is right here at the beginning. So 
in effect, what we have is something that is going to be good for the majority of the wave function, way out to infinity, but at the very innermost part, maybe not so good a fit. Does this make a big difference? Well, it turns out that this deviation at small r, so I'll call that the small r deviation, does have some consequence when it comes to energy. Why is that? Well, let's draw what the energy part of these things look like. So now the energy, I'm going to relate to uh, you know something like e to the minus z e squared over r. Okay, that's the, basically the Coulomb attraction between uh, the atomic nu nucleus with charge plus z and the electron. Okay, so when I draft when I graph this function, it's going to look like this. It's a negative, okay, so it's an attractive force, um, but you can see that it goes down, and in fact, as r goes to zero, this goes to minus infinity down here. All right, well, what is the part where we have the biggest difference here? Well, it's at r near zero. So really, the critical uh, part of this wave function, uh, sorry, the critical part of the wave function, the critical part of the energy is this part. And look, this is where, if I were to draw uh, a graph of where the energy differences lie, I'm missing out on all this energy because uh, I've got a flat wave function here when I should have a wave function that's coming up to a point. So, in fact, this turns out to be um, the cause of error in our measurement of energy. And it makes these maybe be a little bit less effective. So how would we go about fixing that? Well, one way to fix it is the way we uh, fix a lot of things. Let's just take a bunch of them and add them together. All right, so instead of having just one Gaussian, if we took a set of Gaussians and said, I'm going to make this, uh, this Slater orbital um, look like a sum over a set of Gaussians, and so I'll, I'll just call this C sub K, e to the minus alpha k r squared. All right, so in other words, I'm going to take this as my starting point. Maybe I'll add another Gaussian that's really narrow and, and tall and, and so forth. And as I add these things together and normalize them and so forth, I can get a function that gets closer and closer to the Slater-type orbital uh, that I want up here. All right, so I, I, I say that I'm fitting this. Really what I'm fitting is this to these Gaussians, because uh, the other parts are, are essentially going to be the same, the angular part and the r to the n minus 1 part. All right, so when we do this, um, what, we're, what we're trying to do is basically use Gaussians in place of this exponential decay, because it makes calculating some things a little bit easier. Now, the way we would, rec the way we would denote these kinds of uh, expansions in a set of Gaussians is we would uh, call this basis set STO for Slater type orbitals. And each Slater type orbital is composed of n different Gaussians. So the G here stands for Gaussian. And so if I have, for example, an STO 3G basis set, that means I'm using Slater type orbitals, but I'm not actually using the real Slater orbitals. I'm using these three Gaussians to represent each Slater type orbital, which will make the mechanical calculation of things uh, quite a bit easier than just using the Slater orbitals. Um, but, um, but a little, you know, there's a little bit more work involved in the sense that we're using three functions in place of one for every time. Now, you may be wondering about these expansion coefficients. Where do those come from? Well, in this case, we're not going to fit them variationally. We're simply going to use them in a least squares fit to the Slater type orbital. So we're trying to reproduce the function. So these things are basically come from a least squares fit of the function, and then they're fixed. So they never change once we start doing our quantum mechanical calculation. Now the other thing that I, that I want to uh, emphasize here is that Gaussians help us also with the multi-center part of this calculation. So let me draw a picture of what I mean. All right, if I have two Gaussians centered on different points, and uh, this is what a Gaussian looks like. It's, it's sort of a big bell-shaped curve. In fact, it is the bell-shaped curve. And here's another one out here. 
All right, now I've drawn them as very thin Gaussians, but let's say that they're broader Gaussians, so they look something more like this and like this. All right, if I want to evaluate, for example, a product of these functions over all space, it turns out that the product of these functions the itself, if I were to take the product of this shaded Gaussian with this open Gaussian over here, this Gaussian, what I would get is in fact itself a Gaussian. So in other words, the product of two Gaussians is going to give me yet a third Gaussian, but this third one is going to be centered in between the centers of the two Gaussians. I haven't drawn it exactly right, it'd be shifted over a little bit this way, but I think you get what I'm saying. What we'll end up with is when I multiply two, I get one Gaussian, and I can readily calculate all those integrals over Gaussian functions, you know, integrals that are of the form r to the n, e to the minus alpha r squared, dr from minus infinity to infinity. These are all tabulated. So they're easy to, in a computational sense, they're very easy to calculate. So the Gaussian uh, system of representing these Slater type orbitals solves the problem of the multicenter basis functions. And because the, the integrals are all very well known, it also makes this uh, an efficient calculation. And so that's why most of the uh, computer electronic structure codes use basis sets that are built on Gaussians.